Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the online show where we dive into the insights of municipal political leaders from coast to coast to coast here in Canada. Now, our mission is quite simple. It is to shine a light on the dedicated individuals who day in and day out work around the council table to shape the communities that we call home. Joining us for today's episode is Town of Lamont, Alberta Councillor Al Harvey. The Town of Lamont is a vibrant community with over 1,800 residences located on the Western High Load Corridor to the northeast of the community. The local economy, mainly agricultural based, with a growing impact from local industry. Easy access to Elk Island National Park, along with an extensive local park system, hockey and curling arenas provide abundant recreational opportunities for visitors and residents alike. From the smallest village to the largest city across every region of the province, Alberta Municipalities represents the communities where over 85% of Albertans live. AB Munis provides a united voice for 265 of Alberta's 330 municipalities, including summer villages, villages, towns, cities, and specialized municipalities. As Alberta's largest municipal group, AB Munis listens to municipal leaders and advocates for solutions to their common issues. Additionally, AB Munis supports local governments by providing services specially designed to meet their operational needs and they bring their members together regularly so they can share ideas and information so that their communities can thrive. Check out Alberta Municipalities at abmunis.ca and follow them on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, now called X. Councillor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start at the beginning, if you don't mind, and ask you the same question that I've asked every other municipal leader who's ever come on the show. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Al? Well, Chris, um, I guess that the, the whole idea of duty to serve comes from the fact that that's being part of the community. So, you know, you grow up and your parents tell you that you need to be part of things. That as a child, I can remember uh, working with the Onaway Ag Society on uh, fundraising so that I could play hockey. I can remember uh, doing things with my mother with cancer and those kinds of things. Uh, when I was moving into my working years, I came up the community development recreation side. So I spent a lot of time with uh, sports groups, culture groups, um, human development, human resource, and uh, spent a lot of time with FCSS type people. And um, so I was a, a coach for senior boys basketball for about 17 years. I was a coach for hockey. I was a coach for other sports. Um, this kind of, I was a Lions member, a Kinsman member, those kinds of things. It's just to me an extension of uh, being a part of your community. And uh, um, your job is to serve as a person. And everybody has to recognize they need to serve somebody. Service can come in many different ways, though, and you understand that from your brief description there. It can be through coaching, can be through volunteerism, but you chose the municipal route in 2017. Was there a desire to get behind the council table and give back in that avenue, or did you ever think one day I would become a politician? The politician part wasn't really as strong. I had spent about 40 years, I guess, in senior management, 25 of them in the other side of the desk as a CAO. And so uh, I spent a lot of years as a CAO working with elected officials. And when I was no longer uh, a CAO with the municipality, right now I'm a CAO with the Water Commission, um, it was a a case of, no, there, I still think I have uh, stuff that I can provide or, or uh, information I can help out with. And it was a case of trying to stay on the other side of that table and, and do the governance thing instead of the administration thing. 
So you were the very first person I've had on the show who went from being a CAO of a municipality to a council member. I've had it go in reverse. I've had a councillor become a CAO or a mayor become a CAO. So this is a unique question I'm going to ask you here. Is it hard to turn off your CAO brain when you're behind that council table, knowing that you're now making decisions, not implementing the decisions? The short answer is yes. It is very hard, um, and it can get you into trouble if you're um, not being careful with it. Uh, I had one CAO earlier that um, she and I had her own message the same way I had with my staff. You know, when she felt I was going from governance to administration, she'd give me a certain look and kind of lift her finger up slightly and that was enough to tell me, no, she thinks I'm getting into her territory, bugger off. And I would do exactly that. Um, so, you know, it is difficult, yes. Um, and to a degree, you're asking questions to which you predominantly already know the answers. So it's just a matter of I'm one voice of seven. But by the same token, if I ask a question, it's to try and help the others understand um part of the situation that the administration may or may not have presented. So in 2017, you decide to put your name on the ballot for the town of uh, Lamont, uh, Alberta, for the first time. What was going on at that time that you said, this is my time? This is the time that Al needs to step up and give back to their community. Was it just it happened to be an election year or was there other things that were going on in the community? Can you remember back to then to say, OK, I think my expertise with municipal experience or in the fields of volunteerism would be a good voice around that council table. Um, I guess there was a couple of things. Number one, um, I had gone from full-time CAO to uh, contract interim CAO, contracting different places in 2015. And, uh, Working out of a suitcase can be a bit of a bother. Uh, but the other part of it was, uh, to be honest with you, um, there were some residents that came and said, hey, um, why aren't you there? And I said, I have no idea. And they said, well, you have lots of thoughts and ideas. And I said, yeah, but I'm just one. And they said, well, your one would be nice to hear. And so that kind of uh, made me think, yeah, that's, maybe something to look at. Um, things were very stable. There wasn't a lot of issues or concerns or problems. Um, it was just a matter of, uh, yeah, uh, I'm still interested. I think I still have something to, to give. And um, there was uh, you know, some, some residents that said, hey, I, I think you ought to think about this. And so I did. So you are now... Email. So you're now in your seventh year as a, being a counselor for your community. And I can imagine after doing this, these interviews for some time that I've come to the realizations that some of those, uh, those decisions that you have to make around those council tables are probably pretty hard on you because you're making decisions that are going to impact your residents, your neighbors, your family members in your community day to day lives. How important is it for you as a counselor to be open and adaptable to any new information that arises around that council table? Well, it's critical. Um, it's critical, but do you think that, and I hate to interject, and I'm going to sort of preface this a little bit, but First time counselors think they have an idea of how things are going to be and how they, things are going to work. But then you get in there and you actually have to make those tough decisions. It can be daunting because you have your personal beliefs, but you have the people that you were elected by beliefs as well. Well, I'm going to preface like you did, just back up a little bit, because you got to really take a look at what form of democracy are you looking at? I mean, is it more some of the classical uh, Greek where, you know, the individual is elected uh, to speak? 
um, as a part of, and it's more the, the concept of, you know, we'll have a gazebo and everybody will get around the gazebo and everybody will talk because we're a small community. Is it the Roman aspect where you're sitting there saying, um, you know, you are somebody of wealth, knowledge, whatever, we, we will elect you and, and you will be a spokesperson for a whole bunch of other people that don't. Coming back to that, it really doesn't matter as much in my mind as long as you haven't predetermined your answers. You come in being inquisitive, you come in being uh, willing to be interested and willing to listen, you come in with questions. And why does somebody feel this way? What is the reason? What's motivating this thing to this point? Um, taking a look a little bit at the uh, uh, the fourfold factor that the uh, uh, Rotary Club used for years as to you know what is true, what is right, what is just, and you know looking at some of those kinds of things um, helps you in in trying to guide where you should be making some of your decisions. Like I said, if you're an elected official, number one, hopefully you've had some time in your community with, like I said, some of these service clubs and organizations that are really good training ground. And hopefully you're still, um, forget how my son used to put it. Um, uh, it'll come back to me, but it was an inquiring mind but he would say that that uh, he's surprised that something has happened this way, or you know his curiosity. And it's a case of okay, let's let's be open, let's be curious, let's find out some stuff before you go and make that decision. At the end of the day, no decision or very few decisions are written in stone. They are written on a piece of paper as a motion. And they can be looked at with new information and they can be changed. And as you go through, you're looking at what is the best decision for the time and the information that you have at the time you're making the decision. Um, in three months, in three years, in three hours, uh, new information could be popping up. But given the information you have, this is what you're looking at right now. So. I love this conversation, and this is the first time I think I've nerded out this much when we talk about different types of democracies, but the only way democracy at the municipal level, in my opinion, works is when you have an engaged electorate, when you have residents who understand what's going on at that council table. 20 years ago, I used to cover municipal politics back in Ontario, and you would be hard-pressed to find 10, 15 people at the council meetings every week. Now, it'd be hard-pressed to find people two people at a council meeting. People may watch them online, but not that much. So when we talk about that Greek uh, democracy method that you just talked about, where the politician is there to represent the views of the people, the views of the people need to be told to the politician, where in the Rome uh, uh, sort of example that you gave, the politician makes the decisions based on what they believe because they were put into power. I would say 20 years ago, we had that Greek method where people would actually be more engaged. Now, I'd say it's a little bit more Rome because there are people less engaged at the municipal level than they were 20 years ago. In Lamont, do you find people willing to be engaged on the issues that are in front of you so that way they can give you their honest feedback about what's going on and how you should decide what vote you should take? Well, you're unpacking an awful lot here. And I'm <laughs> And I'm going to be unpacking things a little different than you are. Okay. Um, I've only been doing this stuff for, I don't know, 45 years uh, as a senior manager. And there's a couple of things that I've learned. Um, the first part is you're right. It works best when you have an engaged, not consulted, uh, community, but a, a community that's uh, engaged in a decision making. Having said that, from the elections that go on and the turnout from other things, I would suggest to you that uh, right now there's a two 
mathematical formulas for consideration. The first one is that, uh, and I had to be an expert before the uh, Alberta Energy Utility Board on this, and this is part of my answer to them. 5% of the population makes things happen. 15% of the population watches things happen. 80% of the population wonder what happened. As long as it's incremental and it is not dramatic, you really don't have an awful lot going on because the 80% is trusting the 15% uh, to try and keep things intact. And that you could argue is your municipal Senate, your know, people at your coffee shop, et cetera. Uh, they're not elected, uh, but they're certainly interested. Now, having said that, there's a second thing that's come along that's newer. And that is there's 5% of the population that doesn't like you at all. Some of it's from the left and some of it's from the right, but they plain and simple don't like you. There's no matter 35. what you say, they don't like you. And just no, put that no, up. No. you can say the sky is blue and they'll say, no, it's aquamarine. <laughs> That's right. Uh, there's another probably 35% that get out and vote and they kind of watch what's happening and they kind of are aware and they'll be interested in, in hearing what's going on. And so you still have 60% of the population that's happy to go about their life. The worst thing that can happen is for the 5% to talk to the 60%. Because if the 60% gets riled up for some reason because of the 5%, the 35% has no chance in keeping things in line. So my view of things is that, yeah, if you want to talk about uh, a bylaw for Hen Lane in town, if you want to talk about dog control, if you want to talk about unsightly yards, you're still doing incremental movement from where people's norms are. And that's the majority of what municipal is looking at. Having said that, when you start getting outside of that box and you start going into things that perhaps aren't within things that could be ultra-virus, um, that's when things start to get a little more wonky. So if you're a major community and it's before the cell phone laws have come in, you can't talk on the cell phone and, and drive at the same time. <clears throat> that used to be totally legal. Um, but there were some communities that said, no, 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 we're going to put in a cell phone ban. Well, as soon as the province put in the law, of course, that cell phone, that bylaw becomes ultra-virus and it has to be kept, moved out. But that's also because the municipality was moving into an area that was perhaps not within their purview in the first place. And as soon as you start doing some of that stuff, then things, I think, get a little more testy and difficult. Housing, homelessness, um, safe injection sites. Um, those things are outside of what our Constitution had intended and, for the most part, what we look at. And as soon as we start doing more of that, we start getting things into a little, little more murky, troubled waters. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you a little bit on that, because in your few decades of being in municipal governance, whether it be elected or in senior administration, you have probably seen the shift from a more provincial centralization to a more decentralized in more municipalities going upon their own uh, sort of mantra. We're seeing housing issues being downloaded on municipalities. We're seeing homelessness. We're seeing X, Y, and Z, a lot of social issues being downloaded that we weren't traditionally seeing in the early 2000s, even the late 1990s. Do you think municipalities are debt or are set up to address these issues locally or do you think it needs to be sort of pushed back onto the province and, and i'm asking a political question here and i apologize for throwing it in here but i think you're prepared for it but do you feel like we need to sort of up the issues or do the municipalities need to address them locally because that's where the residents want them addressed the horses are of the barn and the doors <laughs> For the most part, it's too late. Having said that, the province changed the MGA in Alberta to provide the municipalities with natural persons powers. Yeah. And this is, I don't know, my third MGA or my fourth MGA. Um, you know, there, there was a time when the money 
generated from a hamlet, 50% of all taxes from a hamlet had to go back to the hamlet. Um, there was a time when the mayor was not allowed to vote unless to break a tie. There was a time when um, you were told in very straightforward terms within the municipal administrator's handbook, thou shalt not get into certain areas, very similar to how um, education works with their superintendent and their board. I mean, there are places where the board just shall not go. So municipalities, I think, um, were given natural person's powers that the act was loosened up dramatically, used to be phone municipal affairs and get an opinion. Now it's municipal affairs telling you to call your lawyer and get an opinion. Um, and then the other part was, you're right, some residents were thinking this is where things need to be gone. But the problem was, um, it does not necessarily mean that that thought process was correct. I would argue that it's not so much downloading as it is so much uh, that the province has chosen not to do its job and somebody else has stepped in and they've started to do what is the province's responsibility and the province has quite happily said, okay, you go ahead and do this and we'll give you some grant money as an assistance. Uh, but by the same token, um, you know, somebody else has stepped in where, um, like I said, the horses out of the barn is long gone on those topics. And the problem was the horse should never have been allowed out of the barn in the first place. So it that, should have been go going back. And the other part of it is we don't have it here as bad, but I remember talking years ago to an administrator from uh, um, north of 60 type of thing. And he said, they don't have a territorial government. They have a terrified government. And they're waiting for the municipal side to tell a terrified government what needs to be done so that the terrified government can do things. They don't have a territorial, they have a terrified. Yeah. And at times, I almost think that um, we're moving in that direction, that too much emphasis is being placed uh, because we are a ward of the province at the end of the day. Um, that's the way our constitution is set up. There's only two levels of government. There is not three. There's only two. And if, the problem is- If you ask any lot. municipal, uh, provincial or territorial association president, they will disagree with that statement. But according to our constitution, you are right. We, there are only two, provincial, federal. I think grade 10 civics taught me that. So if I didn't teach you that, I don't know what we're doing here. Um, right. And that was taught, I used to teach that in grade six civics. Uh, as a CAO, they would bring me in and I would teach that. And, and I would suggest that a lot of people, uh, the public would fail a grade six civics course because they would not know some of the answers such as there are two levels of government. I had a municipal affairs person try and convince me that there were actually four and that the fourth level was Aboriginal and uh, First Nations. And I was just like, no, the constitution has not been changed. Um, there is these definite differences. And I think the more that they get blurred, the more trouble that we get into. And I don't think that it's necessarily the province um, downloading. I think it's municipalities uh, going into areas that are not their jurisdiction and then crying that they don't have the resources once they've gotten into something that they never should have gotten into in the first place. What they should have done is held the province's feet to the fire and say, no, we're not letting the horse out of the barn. Okay, so I wanted to turn to his next segment, but you just mentioned something I have to ask before I turn to the next segment, and that is Lamont as a whole. Um, you're right. There is a blurring of jurisdictional lines going on in this country, not only in Alberta, but I would say across Canada right now. Traditionally, most people would know that municipalities deal with sewer, roads, uh, wastewater, garbage pickup, taxes. Pretty straightforward, snow removal. 
than provincial healthcare education. 10 years ago, I would say that would probably be pretty well known. Since COVID-19, the whole gambit's changed. Not a lot of people know what levels do what. You are the closest to the people. You are in your community 24-7. You make a decision, you're picking up groceries the next day, and they'll probably be more likely to know who you are than their MP or their MLA. Do you find people talking to you about provincial and federal jurisdictional issues? And how do you tell people that's not my jurisdiction because they've come to you because you are the closest to the people and they've elected you to solve their issues? I, I do. As a matter of fact, for years, I've had people that have, I've, I've intentionally for years been fairly uh, um, consistent. We have, we don't have super boxes. We have a post office. And so for years, I've gone to get my mail at 12 noon. And for years, I've had people waiting for me to show up so that they can ask me questions when I get my mail. Um, now, having said that, it's always important that you, A, make sure you're hearing what they're saying. B, understand that there is certain things that they need to talk to somebody else about and making them aware. And C, uh, there, it doesn't mean... It, it doesn't mean that I can't raise that concern. So if I get an RCMP report at the last council meeting, and I am concerned that the report says that we have X volume of, um, com of RCMP actions on uh, spousal abuse type things, is that really something that is, quote, a municipal responsibility? Having said that, is there ways that I can speak to that? Is there ways I can encourage things with the RCMP? Can I have a voice at K-Division? Can I have a meeting at convention with a minister? Can I, you know, there's lots of things that I can do um, that are not necessarily a direct municipal thing. And I can hear somebody's concern and say, listen, I can't make a bylaw that says that you can't hit your spouse. What I can do is I can go after the resources that we have locally and see what can be done in regards to awareness, in regards to uh, protection, in regards to those kinds of things so that you know we can try and reduce this. Uh, those are things that I can do uh, and that I can work with um, others, uh, but by the same token, I'm not going to put some kind of a municipal bylaw that's going to talk about what people are going to do in their bedroom. I want to turn to the town as a whole for a second, and I want to preface this line of questioning with this. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council. This is not a direction of council. This is not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. He has one vote on council. He needs a majority to pass anything along with his fellow councillors. So, councillor, in your opinion, at the time of recording this in early September, what do you believe is the biggest issue facing your community today? My belief is that it is the structural uh, economic development points that relate to our assessment splits. Explain. Right are now, you, are you talking about com commercial residential split? Or are you talking about industrial residential split? I'm talking about residential, non residential split, that most of our taxes come from residents, that um, we do not have the level of non residential assessment providing us with taxation dollars. If we had some greater economic development, if we had some greater non-residential uh, development, which of course will lead to residential and it will lead to other commercial, um, that would allow the community to um, grow, prosper, and probably be in a lot better shape. Um, our size is such that um, we're 
really difficult to, to you know, under 2000 population is a really difficult size to, to try and operate through. For those who may not be aware, but Alberta municipalities are traditionally starting their budgetary cycles this month. Usually October is when they really get into the nitty gritty. November, December is when they get passed or even in the new year they get passed. Um, looking back on the last four years after COVID and a lot of challenges that are brought on by budgetary constraints and economic challenges, inflationary pressures, not a lot of building, not a lot of movement in the job market right now. Is this going to be a tough budget cycle for you? The short answer is yes. The longer answer is we do have a longer term capital. We do have a longer term operational. We are trying to do things that are um, incremental where we can. We are trying to keep some of our infrastructure moving forward. And from that perspective, um, I would anticipate that it will be bothersome. It will be an irritant. It will be a process. Having said that, um, it's 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 something that you have to go through, but it's something that a lot of people don't really fully understand. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was an administrator, not as an elected official, um, we were taking a look at tax rates. And at the time, I was a rural manager. And I had to go to council and say, listen, if I was to receive all of the municipal taxes from this hamlet, do you realize that it would not pay for the streetlights? And that's a fact. All of the municipal portion of the taxes from that hamlet will not pay the streetlight power bill. So that puts you into perspective of, okay, now what other services are you offering and how are you offering those services to that hamlet? Because the hamlet is getting services above and beyond those of a straight rural resident. And, you know, it's something to, to be aware of. And when you start understanding that, then you start trying to understand how are you going to uh, get things done in what you what you want or need. How are you going to utilize grants? How are you going to utilize sponsorships? How are you going to use fees and charges? How are you going to um, you know, balance things. And that's where things become a little bit more interesting as a conversation. Do you think Lamont has, uh, has struck that right balance between being able to find deficiencies along with being able to provide the services that residents have come to rely on? Um, I would love to say yes, uh, but that would mean that the budget process would be uh, 25 minutes and we would be done with uh, the review of things. So it's going to have to be no. We haven't struck, struck, struck the right balance. And I also think it depends upon uh, um, not just as a counselor, but getting back to, you know, the residents. Um, how are they feeling about, you know, what are they paying? What are they receiving? Uh, do they have the first idea of how much snow clearing actually um, looks at. And in some communities, you gotta remember that snow clearing is not a budget item the same way because it's not done by contract. If it's done by internal forces, the snow clearing budget is really not a budget. It's just part of public works. And it's usually an estimate depending on how much snow falls that year, so. Um... That's right. Just on the last note before we turn, because I am cautious of time here and I realize we're about 40 minutes in and I haven't got to my last segment, so I'll make this a quick question. During budget cycles, you probably will have people who present to you at council and ask for their things that they want, whether it be uh, service level upgrades at a library or changes to operational hours at the uh, arenas or whatever you wish. But you have to look at the bottom dollar. Municipalities can't run deficits. They cannot go into the red. They have to stay in the black the entire time. 
how do you balance the and how do you as an individual counselor balance the needs of the individual with the good of the 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 community as a whole And for those who are asking, yes, that was a Star Trek, the Wrath of Khan quote, the needs of the, yeah. of the many, the way the needs of the few are the one. I, I guess what I'm going to be coming back to is that uh, that 5% that do, 15% that watch, for the most part, by doing incremental changes, not necessarily whole scale. So if your recreation budget has got a deficit of 300000 and you need to spend a little bit more on parks and a little bit less on something else, then, yeah, it's still going up from where it was, but maybe the somewhere else isn't going up as high as that need for that park area. So it's incremental. And by doing some of that, you kind of get it through. The thing on the deficits, legally, we can run a deficit. We can run a deficit for three years, but we have to, after, after that time, tell the minister how we're going to get the, the ship straightened. The, the other part of it is the definition. If we take out a debenture, obviously, we're spending more money than what we anticipated. Now, having said that, it's also an issue of timing. Uh, when rates were low, and uh, we timed it quite well, and you know that you need to do uh, a chunk of, of road work, um, maybe it's not a bad time to just throw out a debenture. And you've got a couple of debentures that are about to be retired pretty soon. Hey, at that point in time, you've still, you were making payments before, you're still making payments, but in this case, you're getting, you know, instead of a block done, you're getting four or five blocks done. Um, hey, maybe that's not a bad thing to do. Um, I want to turn to my la second last segment. There's a question I want to ask right at the end. I did not prepare you for it, but I want to ask it because it's a new part of the show. Uh, I want to talk about tourism. I think tourism is an untapped resource in this country and in this province. A lot of municipalities have a story to tell and they have hidden treasures and hidden gems within their individual communities. For yourself, what are some of the hidden gems of your community that you wish people would come up and see? There has been some attempts, and I think they were quite good, in recognizing some of the history. And the history that I'm going to speak to is what is being defined as the cradle of Ukrainian civilization or Ukrainian settlement in Canada. And that's this area. So this is where I, a couple of Ukrainian gentlemen first came out and actually settled. And so the Ukrainian population is not small and is not uh, without a lot of other um, thoughts and people and has some very, very strong biases and thoughts. And that's part of where uh, Lamont has. The other part of that is the Ukrainian um, prefers to be very quiet to itself. So amongst themselves, very, very, very proud, but beat on the chest and, and speak to things even with a horrendous war going on, um, you just don't see it as compared to others. And so that's, that's I guess, the first hidden gem, treasure, understanding. Um, the second is that we happen to be located just north of Elk Island National Park. And the majority of the traffic comes in on Highway 16 in the south. But... 10 minutes to the north, if it's raining out, you can go and get a pizza. If it's, you got a problem, you got a home hardware 10 minutes to the north that you can pick up a tarp. Uh, you've got, you know, these kinds of things that are right there. And so that's part of a tourism thing that we've been trying to tap into more. And I would suggest that we had greater success in probably the 1950s, 1960s. But Parks Canada is Parks Canada. So we're trying to work on that one, but it's 
um, it's an interesting organization to try and uh, get anything into. Um, what about yourself? Is there a spot in the community that you can go and decompress after a long day of council meetings, after a long day of work? Is there a spot in the community that you just go and you know that you're going to just be able to let it all go and then tomorrow morning get back up and try to leave your community better off than you did the day before? Absolutely. Uh, Hillside Park has got a walking trail and it goes around uh, a small body of water. It has a couple of viewing stations. Um, there is uh, a location that I think with a little bit of work, um, I'm trying to remember his name. Uh, oh, I, it just, uh, there, there was um, a Catholic, uh, uh, Isisi. Um, uh, anyway, that, that type of uh, a sitting area with okay. plants and a large stone and uh, nice reflection type areas. So, yeah, in Hillside Park, there's several. There's ball diamonds on the other side of it and, and concession building and that kind of stuff. But the area that goes around the, the water body with the large hill, that's the area that uh, is great for that. So I said I was going to ask you a question I did not prepare you for, and this is the time for that. As Alberta is heading into an election year, we are setting up for the municipal elections in October of 2025. This episode is being recorded in September of 2024. So in less than a year's time, the unofficial start of the election begins municipally in this province. Will we see Al Harvey's name on the ballot again in 2025, or does he still have service to give to his community? I don't know. And the reason I don't know is uh, has more to do with health than it has to do with other things. Um, but the second part of it is um, health, family, and uh, I've done two terms uh, by that time, and you know that's that's not too bad. Uh, so I honestly couldn't tell you. I don't know yet. Um, I'll have a bit of a conversation with my wife and family. Awesome. So my last question for you here, because I'm cautious of time, and I want to thank you for the uh, extra time that you did uh, provide to me. But in your opinion, what makes Lamont such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Um, I think that Lamont has always been in my mind, like I moved here for a job about 18 years ago. And the big thing at the time was it has a hospital. It has K to 12 education. Um, it has more doctors per capita than an awful lot of areas. It has an easy drive. Uh, so I've got season's tickets to the Elks, season's tickets to the Mayfield Dinner Theater. Uh, for date night, those are easy drives. Um, if I have to go to the city, the sun's behind me. I don't have to drive into the sun as I'm going in and back out. So all those things make Lamont uh, a very good community around. It also is very close to the heartland which has an opportunity for a lot of jobs and a lot of growth and development of that nature. Uh, and there's a lot of residents who have made a very, very good living working with the plants and uh, um, good, solid, blue-collar uh, employment. So that makes Lamont all great. The interesting part to me is that Lamont is just on um, if you put a circle around Edmonton, it is on the outside of that circle and it's on the east side. And from a planning and development perspective, the east side always seems to further out, get developed slower. So if you're looking at the west side, the north, the south uh, of that circle in Edmonton, there's lots of development, lots of things going on. The east is always a bit the last. So Hopefully there'll be a wave that will sooner or later catch up a little bit with the east, 
And at that point in time, Vermont will be caught up in it. And um, that would be great. Councillor Harvey, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and talking for the last 45 minutes about yourself, about, I, I can't believe I get to say this, but about the democratic possibilities of Rome and Greece, and also about the uh, town of Lamont. So thank you so much for your time and your just passion to serve. It seems uh, infectious, and I look forward to seeing you at Alberta Municipalities if you're going to be there in Red Deer in a few weeks, and hopefully we can say hi and continue this conversation. I'll be there. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Cross Border Interviews. Now, we hope you've enjoyed today's conversation with one of Canada's municipal leaders making a difference in their own community. Now, if you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an upcoming episode. Your support helps us to continue to bring us these impressive, important stories that you saw today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on cross-border interviews. Till then.